So hello everyone and uh, welcome to this new episode of For For Music's The Soundtrack Podcast. My name is George Trezov and today I'm pleased to have as my guest Forrest Christensen, a composer and film scoring mix engineer uh, and a, also a great musician, recording engineer, overall like a great music producer from LA uh, whose credits include titles like uh, the latest HBO show The Last of Us, Wonder Woman, The Crown, Back to the Outback, Catch-22 and many many others. Um, so uh, first of all I I'm really astonished uh, f first of all, of course, welcome to the show. And I'm also really astonished that you're uh, really a man of many, many talents. So I'm really pleased to have as, as my guest today. Thanks, George. Pleasure to be here. You know, I, it's uh, we've worked together several times and uh, uh, you've recorded, your, your orchestra has recorded uh, my music several times. And it's always been a pleasure being involved and glad to be here talking to you. Likewise. And I'm I'm really serious when I say this that uh, whenever we've we've worked with you on on different sessions, I um, it, it does make a sense that you not only understand music, but you also understand a lot of other stuff uh, along the line of how a pro like a production nowadays needs to be done. So, uh, but before we get into this and talking about you know uh mixing and geeking about plugins and music and composition samples and whatever could you also introduce yourself for for the people who don't know who who you are yeah of course um so as as george said i'm forrest christensen um i live in la i uh i'm a composer and a scoring mixer uh you know i i went to school for composing and film scoring. I went to NYU. And after that, I got more into the engineering world, got more into the mixing world. I started uh, working as an assistant engineer at Remote Control Productions, the opportunity to assist Alan Meyerson for two years on like a huge number of projects. And then after that, I, uh, I met Rupert Gregson Williams. I got the opportunity to assist him for about five years uh, as his like uh, number one composing assistant at Remote Control Productions. We worked on a bunch of movies and television shows, and I got the opportunity to really hone my writing chops there. And then for about a year now, um, I've been freelance doing scoring mixing and uh, additional music for various other composers programming, um, just trying to like do as much as I can in, in contributing to different types of film scores, writing music, making other people's music sound better and, uh, you know, just being involved as much as I can. So yeah, that's, that's, who, that's where I'm at now. <laughs> so, uh, n now that, uh, you're quite experienced in this field, uh, I think that the most important question that everyone is asking is the, what is the first and most important rule or a quality that a composer or a mixer or just like a person working in music on such AAA projects like yourself needs to have? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I would say you have to have a, a respect for, for your clients. I think that's the number one thing. I think respecting their needs and... How, how do I how do I get into that? It's it's a, it's actually a very simple thing. The pro, the music and the project I feel is is an extension of the people who work on it. So the the film and the music that you hear in the film and and everything that you experience from a media you know ex, experiential standpoint when you're listening to the music it's actually all product of people. So working in this field, I found that the most important thing is having like a deep respect and like paying attention and working, uh, focusing my work more on my relationships uh, with my collaborators and like respecting their desires and their wishes for, for the end result. So, you know, focusing more on the, the collaborative and the, the personal side of the, pro of the, project creates this like end result which 
everyone can be happy with. And I, th- I think that really helps make things go really smoothly. Everyone feels positive about the end result, you know, and nobody's, I, I like to avoid the situation where there's a clash of interest, uh, that kind of thing in, in the, in the say for the sake of like, oh, like, oh, I like this. Let, let's say, let's say you said, I like this chord. I like this chord. I don't like this note here, this note here. Hmm. Um, you know, working with people to find like something that everyone loves and like a creative product that everybody can be proud of. I mean, I feel like that's the number one most important mind thing to have in your mind, a skill to have, sort of a mindset thing. Mm. <laughs> and basically, you've you've worked with a, a, a lot of composers, obviously, and from a technical point of view, are all of them like on the same same level, or are they, um, for example, people who are more like old school in a way, like I, I wouldn't say pen and paper. Uh, type of composers, but because I, I guess in in Hollywood nowadays you need to learn your software and your dolls and uh, whatnot. But um, how do you how do you work with people, for example, who don't understand uh, the the process of mixing and the the technical the the software process of mixing? If they ask you, f- for example, to do something that might be clearly impossible to do, yeah. Well, no, I. I... I found that pretty much everyone who's working composer now um, has a pretty has a has a solid sense of the technology that they need to to do it. Uh, you know, I, I haven't worked with anyone who does like the the old school pencil and paper approach. I don't don't see that being uh, very common now. Hmm. But um, I feel like I've been fortunate to work with people who have very good programming chops and you know who come in with great great material talented folks how do you handle different uh people that you work with for example if they some of them they uh, don't have the same knowledge about like technical knowledge about what the process is so obviously oh, yeah. you've worked with people who are competent programmers and stuff and, and so forth but have you worked with other people who are more old school in a way and they don't know samples and software and synthesizers and um, have you also been in a situation where uh, you you are asked to do something that is clearly for example impossible or, or hard to do uh, mm. technically not possible in for example in a small amount of time or something yeah right well there's there's definitely been things that I thought were impossible at first and that's happened to me several times where I was, I've been asked to do something for a mix or for like a, a score and, I, and my first instinct is to say oh there's just no way it, it can't be done but in almost every case it's not that's actually not true it, it was able to hmm. find a way to get at least closer to <laughs> the proper result um, what was one instance I, I did a score mix recently where there were it was strings recorded uh the whole ensemble was recorded live in a room so strings a solo trumpet and a percussionist playing uh like uh, the sticks on the rim of a drum it was very clicky uh, sort of metronomic stick part and that was bleeding into the entire all the other string mics every other microphone had these little clicks in it from the percussionist that's just you know to be expected but it made uh editing difficult there was one part of that where the the percussionist had played the wrong pattern and i was asked to edit in a different part of the uh the pattern i was like well i don't think we could do that because you know there's too much bleed from everything yeah. else and you're gonna have the, most of the stick mics most of the sound of the sticks was in the tree anyway so but like using uh rx is actually able to treat the sticks as if they were stage noises and remove them and then replace them. Uh, so, it, it, like, I, it took me a, a little bit of time to like come up with a, a sort of unusual solution for this thing. That I mean, I, before before the most recent RX updates, uh, that wouldn't have been possible. Yeah, <laughs> so definitely, my, it, yes. Yeah. It, in my mind, I was like, no, there's no way. But then I thought, oh, wait, there are some new tools available for this. 
kind of weird, weird, uh, R- RX is a very flexible, it's so useful. Sure. And, <laughs> and um, do you, um, for example, in this case that you, you said, were you involved in the recording? Uh, no, no, I was, I was just not involved on the mixing side Only. in this particular case. Yeah. Okay. And do you think that you should have been involved in during the session, for example, and let's say maybe say, okay, maybe can we grab this as an overdub, like the, the drums to have more control? I think I, ideally I, I probably would have preferred that, but um, there's a couple uh, reasons why it didn't happen. Number one, I think is that there's a sense, you know, with the, with the musicianship that you want all the musicians in the same room recording together for this like ensemble feeling and everybody's being conducted simultaneously and you have this sense that it was a single performance. So that's important. And I suppose the other sense is that uh, the, the other consideration is, you know, the budget for session time, having to do an, a separate session for just the sticks would be more expensive. So it's that stuff trickles down to the mix and then I have to deal with it. Uh, yeah. Whatever whatever sort of considerations there are for that sort of thing. It's not always the ideal scenario, which I'm used to. <laughs> yeah, it might be kind of unpleasant where you just get tons of material recorded somewhere and possibly a lot of problems that you need to fix yourself. And yeah. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you yourself, you're also composing a lot. And um, what is your process? Do you mix when you your music when you compose? I have done that. Yeah, um, I, I I like I like doing that because I, uh, you know, it, it, I'm very familiar with the music and I, I have a vision for it. I think that I would also love to work with other scoring mixers, and I think that there's a huge value in like having another perspective on the music same with you know having a mastering engineer look at your album mixes uh it, like it's just it's just another set of ears another brain another uh, way of listening somebody who's listening for the first time and uh i think that's really valuable to, uh, to have a, a team of people hmm. um you know and so, someone someone you can trust who shares your your sensibility in terms of this the final sound that's i feel like a lot of composers will find it find a mixer that they really gel with and and stick with them for several projects or yeah well cause cause because it also that. gives you like uh fresh ears on on, on something and yeah, yeah yeah i mean it's something maybe maybe you've heard it a hundred times and you stopped listening to the the, mm. the the piano because it's you know you added you put maybe you put the piano down first and then you added a bunch of stuff over top of it and then you never actually listened to the piano again uh, and it's just been it's just been there in the music the whole time, and then somebody else listens to it, and they're like, "Oh, well, uh, there's all these resonant frequencies in the piano," and you're like, "Oh, wow, I never, I just never." Your brain sort of will tune stuff out that you know is there. Hmm. It's like being in a restaurant, and you can hear the person in front of you talking, even though there's like a hundred other people talking. Yeah. So, I think when you're composing, you can be you can sort of tune out even the rest of your music for like in favor of whatever you just most recently added. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, so I feel like when a mixer hears your music, they're hearing everything for the first time. And uh, that, that, that yeah. it's all, it's all part of a, a blend, a blended piece. What's the, the relationship between a composer and a mixing engineer and a mixer? Is it similar to a relationship that like a director would have with a composer? Uh, I don't think it's similar. I mean, it, uh, I, I think that the the mixing, since it's uh, it's more technical, I, I do feel like it's a service, uh, you know, in service of the composer, composer's wishes. Sort of like it it it's it's collaborative in the sense that you know every mixer has a different approach which they will bring to the table. Uh, but like I think that the composers direction for the mix is always going to be you know the 100 percent like uh priority in terms of it, so it, it's not really it's not really a 50 50 
uh, yep. split collaborative process. It's like a more of a, a 99-1 yeah. <laughs> collaborative process, which is fine. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I think basically what I like to do is uh, spend several days mixing in advance and you know get things sounding how I like. And then the composer will come in and like then they just take they can take over uh we we do whatever that that they're feeling is the right direction to go hmm. so and and yeah, do you that, do do you do different different mixes as well for example one for the uh like for the for the dub of the movie and a separate one for the soundtrack release uh, yeah i have done that it it depends on if it's needed i i don't think it's often needed but sometimes there are little tweaks that we make for the film um like for to consider the dialogue and uh there might be sounds that the composer had to add to the film to like hit certain things that might not uh translate in a purely musical way like if you're listening on an album this random sound might feel out of place but when you're watching the film it would make total <laughs> yeah. sense mm. so so uh Yeah, th those sorts of considerations um, uh, are uh, for the soundtrack album could be could be important, which depends on the project. Because some 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 scores don't have any of those issues to begin with, so we don't bother sure. doing a separate mix. And uh, the other consideration, I guess, is like the, the the album is in stereo, and we often do the score mix in like yeah, surround formats. So we but, have to rebalance. But that the that might change with. Uh, that might change with the Atmos with uh, Apple. Uh, right. Well, if you did if you did uh, an Atmos score mix to begin with, that could and then you you reference you refed it on headphones using spatial audio while you were mixing. It seems like that actually takes a lot of time, which and it's not relevant to the film mix. Mm -hmm. um, so I wouldn't do that during a score mix. I think it would be like once you do the score mix, and it sounds great in Atmos. Go back and ref in on headphones using spatial audio it, if that's what you want to do for the soundtrack. So yeah. you know, it's more about the theatrical experience. Yeah. At first, so yeah, I think there's a lot of different considerations for the soundtrack, but uh, it depends on the project. And and how often? Because y you would get like, for example, one of my most favorite scores is Kingdom of Heaven. And you get the hmm. CD release of of that one. It, it's by Harry Gregson Williams. In case someone uh, hasn't listened to it, in that case, do listen to it. It's a great, mm. great album. Mm -hmm. But you also get a bunch of cues which are not released in the soundtrack. Uh, how how often does that happen? Uh, oh, pretty much always. I've that I've seen. I mean, there's there's just not enough space on the on a CD or like a standard album for all of the music in a film. And then an another consideration is that not all the music in a film can make sense on an album. Some of the, some of the cues in a film could be very short, like, you know, 20 seconds or something. Like what nobody would be very compelled by a 20 second track on an album. So those get those get either edited into edited together with other things or they just get removed. Mm. And then Yeah, I, I, I think I think it's just length and interest considerations. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, and when when you're mixing, how much of how big part of of your process is in the box, and do you use uh, any hardware units or? I'm I'm fully in the box, and that you know that's partially because I'm fully been freelancing for about a year and that stuff is expensive but it's also because the channel counts are really prohibitive so like if you can imagine a uh, a mix with you know 20 5.1 stems how are you gonna use a outboard gear to any like significant effect on those stems maybe you could use one thing on one sound but it's not gonna it'd be hard to use bus like bus compressors analog bus compressors for instance yeah Because you, a you're in surround format and b there's like 20 final mix buses, <laughs> so yeah, um, it just would take way longer to print everything, and and you actually wouldn't be able to predict what the, it would sound like. So there's there's a, there's a lot of reasons why uh, it's not feasible 
in score mixing. Hmm. And and you you mix in Pro Tools or yeah, yeah. correct. Yes, I write in Cubase, uh, and, and that's because Rupert writes in Cubase, and I you know I was I adopted that from him, and then yeah, you, and yeah, you 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 mentioned Rupert, so you've you've uh, you've been an assistant for Rupert Gregson Williams for uh, quite some time, and um, how difficult is the job of a composer assistant? It's very tough. You're you're responsible for everything. I mean, and and it depends who you're working for, what what you're responsible for. I mean, some t some composers have bigger teams um, where where you get to be a little more specialized because somebody else is specialized on like another task. But I think that the hardest part about being a composer assistant is sort of a work life balance because, and 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 that just goes on to. The, what's probably the hardest part about being a composer is that it, it t can take over your whole life. It can take over all your free time, your your sleep time. You know, it, it's it it and it can have a detrimental effect on your health and your mental health if you're not careful. So, um, and that's because of the you know time commitments, because of the expectations of production on like your pr your productivity and your output. You know, it it's, it helps to to try to not get too personally invested in your own music, but that's like also takes away what makes composing so rewarding. <laughs> mm. So like we want to feel good and personally invested in our music, uh, and and that we've and proud of the output. But then to uh, feel that way and then be constantly shot down, and rejected by you know, filmmakers and other people you're working with can be disheartening. So finding like a balance between being invested and then not being invested at the same time, it's sort of a, a balancing act mentally. Um, but uh, yeah, I think, I think for an assistant, I mean, assisting, you feel like I, I, I didn't start out assisting straight out of school. I had been doing like a lot of smaller projects, my own odd jobs. And the mentality that you have in any job, I think, or at least that I had, was that I want to do a good job all the time. So I remember like very being very project focused, uh, being very focused on like technical and like output and uh, like the quality of, of things and making sure everything goes smoothly, which is all very important. Um, but what I wasn't focused on was like my personal relationship with like my mentor. And over time, I realized that that was actually the more important thing to focus on, which I, which I, which goes back to my first point about, you know, relationships with collaborators and on creative projects being the more important than, than the actual, the way you're actually creating. <laughs> Um, in, in terms of getting yeah. a, a quality product, which is sort of, which feels, it feels uh, counterintuitive because nobody, nobody can hear your relationship when they listen to the music, but not, at least not directly, but I do think it comes through and I, I think it also can contribute to, you know, your professional success um, if, if you approach hmm. your work that way. And and speaking of of this, do you also as a composer assistant? Because you sometimes either rearrange, arrange, find, write music, um, you know, finish cues or do do edits. I suppose. But uh, do you also do you think that you need to be kind of uh, to to intimately know? The musical language of the composer that you work you, you work with, you know, typical harmonic, for example, changes, uh, or typical melodic lines, or typical instrumentation. Do, do do you need to know as a composer assistant such details? Well, not at first. I think at first, um, any 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 assistant is not going to start out writing anything. Um, they're going to start out doing technical work and 
you know, conforming cues, picture changes, and 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 sort of, you know, they're not going to be creating any harmonies or melodies at all. So you learn it on the job, and, and I think you know it's important to pick if you can't if you have the opportunity to like sort of s- search out your your heroes or you know people whose musical style that you connect with already. You say, oh, I want to learn how to write like this. Maybe you heard a score and you, you said, who wrote that? And you find, find out who. And see if, you know, see if there's, that's an avenue you could pursue. And, you know, there's a lot of talented composers out there. So I th- hopefully there'd be more than one <laughs> person <laughs> who you feel that way about. So, you know, I, I think if you approach that and you find yourself working with somebody whose style you admire, which happened to me, uh, you know, in, in both cases, like I started working for as Alan's assistant. And the reason is because I, I, I was really, I was listening to a bunch of score records and I said, why do these all sound so great? I looked at them and they were all mixed by Alan. And so he became like on my radar, like the person that I felt like I could learn the most from. And, um, uh, you know, I, I, I reached out to a friend of mine who was at remote, uh, working there. And hmm. that led to an opportunity for me to do an interview there. So, I mean, I, I obviously I could tr- attribute that a lot to luck, but also to, you know, my, my own focus on finding somebody who I felt like I could learn something from. And does the technical work when you, cause when you were, uh, I suppose it's kind of different when you were assisting Alan and when you were, you were assisting Rupert, the, the the jobs that you had to do at that time. So we, with, yeah, very different. Yeah, with with Alan, was it more like comping, editing, routing, or I, I don't know what's what was the? Yeah, know? I mean, it, it's basically using every part of Pro Tools <laughs> at one point or another. Mm-hmm. Uh, there, I there's I thought I knew how to use Pro Tools uh, when I started that job, but I soon learned I didn't know hmm. there were a lot of menu items and buttons and things that i had never ever pressed um on <laughs> before <laughs> so uh you know I, i but basically the job uh, involved like setting up pro tools sessions uh you know it, uh, setting up building templates learning how he's using certain settings uh like thematically or or like Uh, ac- across the score and applying them correctly. For example, like you have maybe an orchestra that's recorded in stripes. Uh, like you, you could have harmonic strings, short strings, uh, long legato strings, short brass, long brass, etc. recorded separately. And then understanding uh, all the different moving parts, like the reverb settings, the EQ settings, the microphone position settings that correspond with those different types of sounds. And then applying them in bulk, sort of to an hour and a half of music. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> so that that was, you know, the biggest part of that job was getting all that done and done perfectly. And then also editing, like editing the orchestra uh you finding finding ways to to use different takes of the orchestra uh, fix the timing especially when things are striped out as i described like nobody was playing with each other so there would be timing discrepancies where uh so those all need to be resolved and that can be a matter of just you know a few milliseconds here and there it's not hmm. it, it sort of it sort of involves and, and pretty... what, what happens if i don't know for example the long strings are recorded in london Uh, yeah. at Abbey Road and the short strings are recorded, I don't know, here in Sofia. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> or right, that would maybe, be, unu- maybe the that other would be way unusual. Around, yeah. No. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, that's that's more the the uh I, I, I that, that more of a mixing concern. You know, I, 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 from an assistant standpoint, that's tough because you're getting files from multiple places in different time zones and they need to be joined together by a certain time. So maybe you would have to show up to work at 5 a.m. in order to do it. But, uh, you know, for a mixing standpoint, that's what that's the challenge there. And that happens a lot, you know, where things are recorded in different spaces. 
you know, fi- finding a way to to to, to blend those uh, spaces so mm. that they are and, cohesive. And speaking of time it, zones, how do you how do you handle time zones, for example? Because uh, when we worked uh, with you, for example, uh, there were some sessions which were starting kind of late afternoonish for for us but that for you would be like 5 a.m or uh, sure yeah yeah uh, well in a lot of cases um yeah and pl- plus I was working in LA and Rupert was working in London and so we we were we were constantly uh you know c- trying to catch each other uh with within a a, a window um in, in my morning where we could chat about the, the day's work but uh yeah it, it with, with scoring sessions i mean that's sort of it's something we live with here is that you know i i think that in la we like working with uh european orchestras um but it's just sort of we're we have to suck it up and wake up early or stay up late in order to to do it so it's just <laughs> yeah. just just part another part of the biz yeah <laughs> another reason why the work life balance is is difficult <laughs> and um you you've worked with uh like you've recorded different orchestras uh around the world in different spaces um so how fr- from from a mixing standpoint how important is the acoustic space uh nowadays how much are you using the decker for example the decker microphones or are you relying oh, on a spots? lot a lot i mean it, it it depends on where it's recorded um like but any any of the, the great you know studios um the the tree the, the decker tree is almost always going to be the pri- one of the primary sources of the orchestral sound at least for, for me there's only been a few instances where things were recorded and small sort of resonant rooms that I was not a fan of where I ended up sort of trying to recreate a better sounding room using like altiverb on the spot mics. And it's, it's tricky and it's just not as, not as uh, good. I, I, I think that choosing the right room is, uh, is really important for when you, when considering like the sound that you want uh, in the, the final, the final mix. And, and you know that's another reason to maybe go with different rooms for different ensembles for your score. I, I think that there's a, a sort of an assumption that you have to record everything in the same room if you want things to be cohesive, but like it might not be appropriate for the sound you actually want. And the, the cool thing about we don't have to sound realistic. It's that's an option. You could say I want my score to sound realistic, but it's not necessary. You could want things to be hyped up in different ways you know a lot of times like like at uh at air studios you could have you can raise and lower the ceiling which is uh really handy for for changing the acoustic property of you know the short recording a short strings overdub day versus a long strings overdub day mm-hmm. yes yeah, so they and, have the option to lower the to change the ceiling and and or yeah 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 there's like a there's like a a, a big set of panels that that when when lower dry up the the tail uh considerably yeah and uh you know i i've done like uh george i don't know if you know this but like on on the crown season two i think for the first episode we had recorded a couple of cues in a couple of different places mm-hmm. and one of them was sophia your orchestra mm-hmm. and i found that we we were like uh trying to figure out well, what do we like what do we what do we like the sound of and and the the room that you recorded in is, is, was was winning hands down so <laughs> nice <laughs> that's how we nice. uh, that's how that's how we ended up going with uh, your recordings for the rest of the season and now this is a bit of a tricky question cuz a lot of orchestras in in Europe especially going kind of to the east they say for example that they recorded 440 but since most of the musicians are usually tuned to 442 for example sometimes even the instruments kind of change in pitch and i know in germany for example teldex they they do 443 straight up oh yeah yeah hmm. so um have you have you had a like a, a situation where just the 
the synths they don't align with the with the uh, recording that you've received and what do you do in such a case well i've worked with vienna uh, a few times and they record at 442 i believe mm. but uh they uh, from what i understand from burned and martin there they 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 clock it back down to 440 before it hits the uh before it hits Pro Tools. Uh, they change it with the, with the sync, yeah. Mm. So uh, that's, it, it sounds great. So I think that that's perfectly viable option. I mean, it works, works well, and I've never had a, an issue uh, because everything comes back into the mix at 440. Mm. So I, I think that would be and, and have the, you... the way to do that. Yeah, sorry. sorry, yeah, go yeah, on. D- sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I would hope that uh, other studios would follow in their method because it works really well mm. i i know that uh because i recorded brass in prague uh in smetchki so they they do they do the same thing uh, okay so the the players play at four for two I, I i guess which in a way especially for brass maybe strings not so much because they change they can they can easily change the intonation uh, but, uh, for example, brass or woodwind instruments, they're built with the mechanic of 442, so they need to alter, in a way, the, the instrument slightly. Right. But right. they change the... Yeah. So, based on um, on your experience, what is the hardest thing that uh, a, a composer or a mixing engineer needs to pay attention during a recording session? What what is the most important thing that you need to pay mm. attention to? Well, I th- I think that the composer needs to pay attention to getting the performance that they want, uh, at, and and at the expense of all other considerations. You know, uh, it basically communicating with the you know uh, with the musicians and the conductor and 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 getting the the best possible performance. You know, and that's. That's assuming, right? That I think everybody else needs to remember that at the session because if the session is going well, the composer would be able to to, to focus on the performance only. Mm. You know, if if things aren't prepared correctly, the, prefer- the composer might have to focus on why are there wrong notes in the score, or might have to focus on what why can't I hear the flute or yeah things like that. So you have a professional team who's prepared comes in, and basically everyone's job is to make sure that. Things are things run so smoothly that the composer can make like can just sort of zone out and talk about the music and get good recordings. I, I think that would be the ideal scenario. And then as a, as a as a mixer attending a session, which I've done a few times, um, you know, I not actually you know, there to work. If as a mixer attending a session that you're not recording, just kind of like learning the music. Uh, thinking like, uh, you know, uh, sometimes sometimes asking like, oh, could we split that out? Maybe I want to add a longer reverb to this sound than, than this yeah. other sound. So can we record it separately? S- sometimes it's handy to be there for that type of thing. But it's mostly just a, a way to, to, to learn in advance um, what everything uh, sounds like. I, I think I don't do, I don't do recording. I, a lot of like, you know, professional s- score mixers in LA will also do their own orchestral recording and that's that's like a a, f- a field that I never got into so which is fine you know you can't do everything <laughs> yeah, I, don't to, yeah. I don't want to do everything I because I, I, I think that the more you do the less well well you do it maybe but <laughs> yeah because then you s- start focusing on on too many things uh yeah. and thinking about a lot of stuff and yeah. all right now speaking of mixing can you name your like top three plugins let's say plugins in the box top three plugins for <laughs> contemporary orchestral orchestral mixing yeah well I'm, I'll, I'll throw out uh tokyo dawn the plugin company they have created a suite of plugins which are very reasonably priced and very useful Especially, I end up using the Nova EQ fairly often. It's a it's like a dynamic parallel EQ hmm. with a gain. What, what's the word? It automatically adjusts the output um, based on your EQ curve. So it's great for score mixing um, in the sense that you can make tonal adjustments without 
uh, changing the loudness balance of different elements very easily. That's cool. Yeah. So I use that a lot. And, uh, you know, the Liquid Sonics reverbs are always being used in my sessions. Cinematic Rooms, Seventh Heaven, can't live without them. A third plugin. Those, that's all I use, just those two. <laughs> uh, do, you, do you find that... I basically... What I love about Cinematic Rooms is that uh, it, it has like um, a surround built in. And right, you, right. Yeah, and you can tweak the, like the rear uh, or the front or the center and have different settings for each, uh, each of them, which is, which is great. I do prefer yeah. the the sound of cinematic uh of sorry not cinematic of Seven Heaven because um, mm-hmm. I also own a Bricasti M7 like a hardware unit but sometimes mm-hmm. it's it's not very yeah it, especially th- th- there are some things that I mix that are have a lot of feedback loops and using a hardware unit would be too painful you know um from time to time but uh, yeah, Seventh Heaven, yeah. Mechanics Hole as a plugin, and <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, yep. Yeah. That was that was uh, one of, one of Alan's favorites. Always always on the recall sheet. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. No, I, I've been. Uh, I, I yeah. It's just it has a bit more coloration. I think for if I get a score that where I automatically think this feels too dry. Then I probably start with Seventh Heavens just just uh, to get a sense of like like the reverb adding something. The cinematic rooms is more transparent, and I'll end up using that when I want to sort of. I don't want anyone to really know that there's reverb being added, but it's mm. it's. I feel like it's more subtle. Um, I they they anyway. also introduced <laughs> um, on on Seventh Heaven. They introduced like this uh, ducking feature which is it's basically like, like a side chain uh, of, the, of the reverb but it's oh, really yeah. nice especially on, on songs if, if you're doing like songs or like solos and you don't want the reverb to wash the music and just come at, at the end based on the threshold obviously right right I've used that on that feature on vocals and it's really quite nice yeah and and do you use any like advanced ai or it's not ai uh, <laughs> plugins but something like sooth or gulfos oh yeah i i those are really i mean i don't i don't know man those those work really well uh both of those plugins are magical what i try not to do is stick it on the mix because i don't like everything to be so homogenous and it, that has this effect of like applying the same the same sound to everything which yeah sort of makes things it makes it makes the mix in my opinion sound a bit thin and lacking character you know i i, I like to apply it more like Gulfoss, for instance amazing on piano it's just because of the p- piano and bells and harp mm. with beca- because those parts are often very wide they have they have a very strong fundamental and they're also have a very wide range. So like you can get a lot more harmonic richness out of a piano track just by applying a little bit of the Gulfoss tame and recover. Usually I usually do about twice as much tame as I do recover on that plugin. And uh it, it can it just makes it shine through and you can you can get a bit more loudness out of those instruments without yeah. feeling like they're overly resonant. Soothe I found when applied, you know you, you can definitely overdo it, but you can. It's great on violins. Um, you, you can sort of emulate to a degree that that you like uh, the, this feeling that they were played with mutes, and it, it just reduce the harshness. So yeah. it's sort of like uh, like a, a a violin mute with a yeah a knob on it, or <laughs> with a knob, yeah, with, with slide halfway on. And normally when, when you're mixing, for example, a contemporary song, like EDM music, you would use a lot of uh, sidechain compression or sidechain, multiband sidechain, or uh, for example, the kick is ducking the bass or the synths to get that nah, 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 uh, right. feel, the groove. Um, do you apply 
stuff like this onto like film scoring, like Tycho's, I don't know, decking low strings, for example. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, uh, I, I think it, it depends on the, the the sort of vibe of the score. Generally, with the score, I'm going for a more dynamic mix where and side chaining is sometimes like it's a method which is very useful in creating a less dynamic mix because you can get sort of constant loudness with things poking through and having a sort of less actual dynamic change so it depends on which direction we're going with with any given hmm. uh cue or score so i don't use it very often but uh you know sometimes and this happens a lot actually i'll get uh mixes where composers were sort of layering low-end elements um, a little bit carelessly, uh, like bass, short basses, long basses, synth basses, low booms, kicks, taikos, all together, and um, it ends up being uh, hard to hard to distinguish any one thing from another. And I, I think sort of an economy of low-end is really something that I try to accomplish um, or like feeling like there's something controlled and powerful and also clear in the low end uh, most of the time, unless, unless like this story is calling for a muddy mess, which happens sometimes. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, I mean, like if say it was a horror, a horror film and you wanted a bunch of muddy mess down there, that, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. Um, but like you know, I think as general rule, I like to to try to clear up that. And side chaining can be really useful, you know, on the low end, for making sure that one thing is, uh, you know, heard over, or you can like carve space for low end elements there. Yeah, I, I think certain. Uh, I I don't I don't feel like a lot of uh, score uh, or c composer clients that I've had are after this like loudness, like like loudness at the. Uh, at the expense of all else, uh, sound, which you would be sort of after in other genres. It's more about emotion and, and bringing life to the story. And, and that's like not um, sort of antithetical to like constantly being loud. Yeah. But it, it, it depends. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, I'm, uh, I suppose that most of the people would uh, want to get that huge for example um who did who did the mixes for uh mad max fury road was it alan or or not i think that tom jxl did those himself because mm. yeah. um, they're yeah. on on some of some of those but also on superman okay superman is another you you get that punchy you know the drums the the sound of the the huge you know percussion ensemble mm -hmm. kind of very well blended with with the low synths and low basses and uh yeah. all those complement uh, each other is this a, an arrangement thing orchestration thing or is it also a mixing thing i well it's definitely but i mean it's it starts with the composing it all starts with the arrangement and the the sounds you pick hmm. and it's definitely it's 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 all that it's it's all that combined i don't know how else to to answer it i think that like uh the mad max the mad max score does seem to be more focused on loudness than a lot of other scores which gives i mean it gives it this sort of like super high hyped adrenaline awesomeness which it just makes you feel like like so stuck like you want to yeah. drive really fast and <laughs> um <laughs> yeah. which is sort of how it's like that that edm feeling it's sort of like like puts your brain on 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 high alert and um yeah i think that's why it works well in that movie like i said i think it, it depends on the vibe you want and like how how it's gonna play for the story for the movie hmm and uh, since, uh, obviously, I, I want to ask you so many questions about this, but uh, our time is running out. And we always have like three blitz questions at the end of okay. each right. talk. And so uh, let's, uh, let's start with the first one. And obviously, it's the first one is 
everyone says it's the the hardest question ever. But so let's see what you think about it. So, what are your three most favorite soundtracks? Uh, it could be either films or games or TV shows. Top three: Blade Runner, the original. Uh, ha, ha, hmm, ha. What is it? Jurassic Park. Actually, scratch that. The Mummy. Okay. Goldsmith. All right. Goldsmith. Mm. And uh, gosh, it's a uh, it's a bullet question. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say something by Thomas Newman, but I can't decide what. Perhaps uh, In the Bedroom by Thomas Newman. <laughs> I have to be honest, I'm not familiar with that one. So it's I just discovered I like discovered it randomly and, and it's it's just it's so beautiful. I don't know. Check it out. Also, uh, you know, I've always been a fan of the Eternal Sunshine score. It's yeah. Just, mm. So it's so perfect. You know, everyone kind of raves about John Williams. Obviously, he's great. But I've always found that uh, Jerry Goldsmith was much more versatile. And he, I mean, he's very well known and he had a fantastic career, obviously. But I, I think he's uh, neglected as <laughs> uh, yeah, undermined well, maybe, or I don't, something I, from, from people. Yeah, maybe so. I, I I I think that his stuff might not be as catchy, but it's certainly like excellent film music. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, it's just thematically his, his his motivic thematic like development through a movie and like it's just one of the reasons I love the Mummy score is um, because of the trumpet sound. It's just yeah. like it's just so. And the, the the sound of the the sound of the brass from a like I don't know what mics were used on that, but if anybody knows, please can please do that again. <laughs> please use them. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, and and well, if if you take like the mummy and also the Thirteenth Warrior, which I love, basically Basic Instinct, Chinatown, uh, L.A. Confidential. The Omen, mm. Alien, um, mm -hmm. Star Trek. Not a huge fan mm -hmm. myself, but still, it's a it's a great soundtrack. It's such a such a variety of covers of orchestration of of writing and written by the same person. It's it, it's just amazing. Yeah. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, yeah, recall. speaking about the brass, <laughs> about about the br uh, about the brass in the mummy. Yeah. What would your dream project be? I love sci-fi. I think that to work on like a, a sort of expansive sci-fi film with that's the problem with sci-fi is I feel like there's there are some like amazing like some of the best movies ever made because of the world building and the 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 the, the, the production uh, design and the music and the the cinematography and you know technological advancements in those films but and then there's a lot of like bad sci-fi so i guess my dream would be to work on some good sci-fi yeah <laughs> which i which i've had the opportunity to do um but not as a composer uh you know and that would that would be that would be my yeah my goal well, is to to try to try to do some some nice uh nice futuristic space music <laughs> Yeah, f fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Yeah. <laughs> and um, all right, finally, so what would be your advice to a younger version of yourself? Yeah, well, I think that, you know, I grew up in Columbus, Ohio, and there wasn't a lot of opportunity there for, for me to develop a, in a, like film or in just, I mean, any composing I was doing was purely out of my own interest you know like like all, all my music development there was you know in school and then when i got home from school and i think <laughs> i would just i would just say like I, it, it was it was really easy to lose track of of uh or to lose hope i felt like there wasn't a lot of 
opportunity or future for for me to do what I was loving doing. And luckily, I I got into like tech. I worked in IT for a while uh, before I got into like doing music professionally uh, for a couple of years. And like my skills doing that actually really translated into assisting because I was able to like troubleshoot uh, you know technical problems and like assist people with uh, their problems quickly and efficiently, which became like a big part of my success at starting out and as an assistant. Uh, I think what I, what I would give my advice, self-advice to do is, you know, try to start assisting sooner. I thought that, uh, you know, I thought I, I thought I had something to offer, which, you know, as a, as a young composer, um, on my own and I thought I could go out and Hmm. make a name for myself, uh, like straight out of school. And, you know, out in the Midwest, there's just, it's just, uh, it's not much happening. So I was, I, I think I would, uh, say, don't be afraid to take the leap and, uh, go search out your heroes and people you want to learn from. And, uh, as soon as possible, because that's, that's for me, that's been the start of my road to where I want to be. Okay. Well, um, Thank you so much for uh, taking the time for this conversation. Yeah, thanks, George. Always, yeah, it's always a pleasure to chat with you. <laughs> yeah, likewise. And I would, I would love to like end this show with uh, maybe something that you've written. So if if you, I don't know, if you wouldn't mind sharing a track of yours uh, that we can just end the show with, I'm sure that everyone will be thrilled to listen to it. This is a recording of a theme that I was asked to write for a South Korean television television series uh, called Sisyphus, which you can find on Netflix. A uh, good friend, Yak Young, who is a music director and composer in Korea, um, asked me to uh, write a few themes for this series, and including the main title. And uh, you can find this theme... Uh, played in several episodes in the second half of the season. Um, so enjoy. All right. Uh, the, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. Well, let's let's listen to it. And once again, thank you for being our guest today. Thanks, George. Uh, my pleasure. And I and, uh, hope we can chat again soon. Yeah, we'd love to. <laughs>